Hi and welcome everybody. Um, we are now about to start the CIFS webinar of our latest members report, Future of Media. My name is Niklas Larsen and I am senior advisor here at CIFS. Together with me I have... My name is Kasper Petersen. I am the editorial manager here at CIFS and the editor of this report, Future Media Key Trends and Technologies. The report looks at uh, the future of public service media, the future of commercial media, and the future of the key media technologies that we judge to be some of the most important in the decades to come. Today, however, we have selected three overarching trends that we think will define the media landscape as a whole in the future. That is acceleration, it is trust, and it is truth. And we will um, yeah, go through them from the top. Acceleration. Acceleration is actually a mega trend that we also work with here at SIFS. In that context, we call it acceleration and complexity, where every and it means what everything we see around us is increasing in pace, as well as the complexity of the things we, we understand. And the general belief is that change is uh, occurring faster than before. And it's certain to say that there's some acceleration taking place somewhere in society at any point in time. Hence, acceleration as a trend is very context specific and it's a debated mega trend since there also will be counter trends of slowing down, deacceleration, if you will. We will come uh, or touch upon that later. But for this particular topic, we will touch upon how acceleration is seen from a technological perspective in terms of media. We will see the acceleration of our social change and we will see acceleration in the pace of life. From a historical perspective, whoop, sorry, from a historical perspective, our recent state of media is actually something we take very much for given without remembering that it is a fairly new state. Throughout history, media has been published from one to many, back from um, books and sanscripts and other types of old school media was developed to we see mass media um, with the signals at the speed of light is still communicating from one source to many, where we actually today have passive consumers being active producers and being the dominant part of media production and distribution. What does that mean? It means that we are breaking down our barriers of what we understand of traditional media usage. What used to be media and sorry, what used to be non-media activity is now considered media activity. The simple example would be shopping, but we also use it in social interactions and we use it when we are doing our education and when we're doing our planning and when we are actually extending our memory into our technologies, that's through media outlets and asset technologies. And speaking of technologies, we have chosen to touch upon three different ones and how it's actually already enrolled in the media landscape and how it could affect the future. Um, we see media and AI where 72% of publishers responding to Reuters Digital News Report, an annual large survey on the state of the media, um, where 72% said that they were doing trials with AI of some sort. Um, we already see AI being everywhere in our media consumption, um, even in our curated feeds where algorithms, things that serve us what we, uh, what we think we need and want. But we also see that Machine learning are used to personalize the content and create better recommendations through intelligent news and aggregation apps, as well as automation of media. Content is um, automatically made to a higher extent. We even see virtual news anchors, and we can raise a question of what role automation will have in, um, in media production going forward. As well as we see Technology coexists with production instead of just replacing journalists, um, where it provides tools to augment the support um, to deal with information overload, including software that helps journalists to find stories in big data sets and so on. 
Another technology is the 5G network that's currently being highly debated on a geopolitical uh, scale. Um, we will leave that out and only focus very briefly on what the technology has in store. And you can reach, read more on, the, uh, on it in the report, of course. What we will see is that we will see much faster transmission speeds and we will get content brought closer to the audiences. Um, it will improve the capabilities for tactile and sensory media experiences. We will mm -hmm. probably see whole new media gadgets um, approach the market with this network enrolled. With the current technologies that we know, such as augmented reality and virtual reality that are on the brink of becoming mainstream, this 5G rollout will probably be the facilitator and foundation for the technologies to, as said, become mainstream. A third and very important technology where we see media have a, a big impact is in, uh, or rather we see have a big impact on media is blockchain. Most of you probably have heard of blockchain in connection with Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, um, but it can be used uh, in connection with media in various different ways. One is that it can ensure micro payment based pricing models going around third parties and centralized actors and going straight from media producer to media consumer. Uh, we can also see it being used um, uh, for de decentralized social media. Again, the same principle going around the third party or the central actor. It will also allow uh, real-time and transparent allocation of royalty payments. So it could be very impactful in terms of uh, copyright and, and so on. So looking at all these technological trends and this acceleration we see across media domains, what's next? What is next if we see it from the vantage point of the individual consumer? Well, one way to look at it is that we are reaching a state of peak media. What does peak media mean? Well, it means that we are soon meeting the limits of how much media consumption we as individual media consumers can cram into our daily lives. Historically, there has been a rapid decrease in working hours from 50 years ago, approximately 2200 hours each year to around 1600 hours each year uh, today. Um, much of this this new time we have, we have found when we have decreased our working hours, we are now using consuming media. Today, the average European spends around 10 and a half hours each day consuming media in the US. That amount is upwards of 12 hours. And we can see that this number has stabilized over the last five years and is expected to increase very little in the near future. So we can say that we have reached some kind of peak state in the amount of hours and minutes we can cram into our daily media use. This is very much driven by the shift from media consumption being linear in the past, radio newspapers in the morning, TV news and TV shows in the evening, to media use becoming much more liquid and seamless in the present. We're never not on Facebook. We're always doing something. We're listening to the radio while we're reading online news. We're always on our email and so on and so on. Media use has become more seamless and this allows us to cram many more hours of media use into our daily lives. This is a trend very much driven by new media technologies. So you could argue, yes, but what about the future? We will see new technologies. Won't they also increase the amount of hours of media use we can put into our daily lives? Yes, but probably not by much. If we take the self-driving car as an example, it's a very hyped media technology because it will essentially allow uh, travelers, commuters to become media consumers. So if you, if you take a look at this slide, you can see they have a little screen going on in the background while they enjoy a, a, a dark and stormy there around the table. <laughs> um, so yes, we can maybe add some screen time to our daily commute, but what we have to keep in mind is we're already using the car today as a media entertainment center. We listen to the radio, we listen to music, we might listen to that old Pink Floyd album in the, in the glove compartment. So while the self-driving car may put some more minutes of media use into our daily lives, it's probably not by a lot. And on a side note, I can identify a lot with this guy. Studies have shown that if we're not necessarily focused on the traffic and navigation, 
while we commute in a car, we actually tend to fall asleep. This is an example of Ford, uh, made from uh, of, um, Ford studies, where their engineers were falling asleep while they were monitoring their self-driving cars. Peak media, where is it leading us? It's leading us towards an attention economy where we are constantly seeking the hunt for consumers' mind space. That's a finite resource, which is why we see formats becoming shorter and shorter and shorter. We today have six seconds ads. We have social stories everywhere where everybody is a content producer and provider, essentially. We have five minute scripted shows on Snapchat on a daily basis. And it, all of this comes to you with zero friction. This is a study from the online media Slate. You won't finish this article and you're probably nodding your head right now. What they did was that they studied their user base and figured out why is it that people are not necessarily going through all of the content when we write an article. And it shows that many visitors simply just, does, simply just doesn't scroll. They read headliners. Most visitors read about 50% and then they're on to the next thing. And most visitors see all content on video and photos. And speaking about being fast, moving fast to the next thing, we actually see that this abundance of information are narrowing our collective attention span. Mm -hmm. This is what a uh, recent study from the Danish Technical University has gotten published in the Journal of Nature Communications. Um, to quote it, it says the collective attention span given to individual cultural uh, items is decreasing. And that is both the uh, popularity of books, the popularity of uh, movies and the cinema, even down to the popularity of hashtags. Whereas in 2013, the 50 most um, uh, popular hashtags were on the list in 17 and a half hour. And in 2016, it was down to 11.9 hours. Essentially, we are moving faster on to the next thing. And we want to raise a point here because does that actually mean that we have shorter attention span or does it mean that we're actually gaining better filtering skills? Speaking of acceleration as a trend, there's always a counter trend. In this case, it's deacceleration, which is why we made this slide saying the future could be slow. We kind of hope it will. Um, you see today by apps and smartphones are tracking your usage on a weekly basis. Personally, I get a notification every Sunday with my smartphone telling me how much I use my phone in comparison to last week. It's coming, it's becoming this um, little competition with myself and my screen usage where I try to keep it low. At least I'm aware now and I, we can hope that this will um, only become um, broader in the future. From a media and content perspective, we see that there's an increasing interest mm -hmm. from unbreaking and finishable news. And what does that mean? As you can see by this snail, it's simplifying a trend called slow media, slow journalism, where different um, media outlets um, internationally are actually uh, having successful growth by doing less pieces, longer pieces, deeper stuff, and people have a higher interest for it. We have The Correspondent, which is now Europe's largest member-based uh, media platform. We have Tortoise, and in, De in Denmark, we have Setland, um, which is uh, an online publication, publication that only comes out with stuff a couple of times a week, but it's longer pieces. They're expected to break even in their business model this year with 10,000 subscribers. They're experiencing growth. This highlights the fact that the higher the frequency of items that you publish does not necessarily make you more relevant in the future. On to the next big theme covered in this uh, today's talk. It's not only our attention that's becoming an increasingly scarce resource, it's also our trust. Each year, uh, Edelman, the global communications firm, does a survey where they look into um, the state of our trust in uh, our governments, in our businesses, in our NGOs, and in our media. And what the survey shows is that there has been a two-decade decline in trust 
and media in many countries is the least trusted institution. There are great variances across geography, of course, and also in terms of which media we tend to trust and distrust, but across the board, media has a very low degree of trust. There are many sources of distrust out there. One of them is this, media manipulation. The image on your right is the original from G20 meeting in uh, Hamburg in 2017. The image on your right is the manipulated image made to appear as if Donald Trump and Vladimir Putin are having a very intimate talk that in fact never happened. Media manipulation is becoming increasingly sophisticated. Many of you have probably heard of deep fakes. This, uh, this uh, technique for manipulating live video feeds to make, uh, for instance, Obama appear as if he says and does things that he has never said and done. Um, so looking across different media domains, uh, as I mentioned before, there's a high variance in, in the degree of trust and distrust. If we look to the very left of the screen, we tend to trust traditional media a lot. That means uh, the old school broadcast media, TV, radio, and also newspaper and print. We also tend to trust the media we find ourselves through search engines. On the other hand, we have a very low degree of trust in social media at least in the West, looking at China to the very right, they have a very high degree of trust, but it's important to keep in mind the media landscape in China is very much different than the one we know in the West. It's much more state control. Looking at the West, however, we see an enormous increase in how much we use social media to get our news and information. At the same time, we see a very low degree of trust. So there is a really interesting di discrepancy here in our values as citizens and our actual behavior. We see this discrepancy in many places in our online digital lives. One place we see it is our approach to privacy online. This is from an experiment done at Stanford University where economists went out on campus and they asked the students, would you exchange three of your friends' email addresses for a pizza? And the vast majority of the students chose the pizza. So this joke goes to show how little it takes for us to uh, abandon our values uh, if it's slightly beneficial to us. To be fair, it's not always easy to bridge this gap between values and behavior. If we as regular internet users were to read through all the end user and privacy agreements that we click accept on during a year, it would take 25 days out of a year. So we have a lot of distrust, at least in digital social media, but who do we trust? Nicholas. That's a good question. And we tried to look into that. So standing on the shoulders of one of the recent reports of European Broadcasting Union, um, we see the evolution of trust from 2012 and 2017. And, um, Looking at the paradox that Casper mentioned in terms of how we spend our time and what we actually trust, it's interesting to see that we are on the uh, on the red side of the slide can see digital and um, digital media, online media. The globe is the internet, and the network is of course social networks. They're actually declining in trust while they're increasing in time used. And if we go to the other side of the slide where we have some green bars. There we have traditional media, radio and broadcasted media, TV. Um, and we have for a decade, probably maybe longer, heard about how these traditional methods were suffering, the business model were bleeding, and the users were abandoning, abandoning them for new, uh, new types of media. However, their sources um, of trust are increasing. So when we look about look at sorry um, acceleration in the media and we look at the new technology and we knew we look at acceleration in our lives and the content we consume and we look at decreasing trust to traditional sources um, and where we spend our time it's a fair question to ask whether where wherever you are in the spectrum of media whether you're a consumer producer facilitator or platform are you actually contributing to the noise made in the media landscape or are you actually making resonance are you making sense and by that we want to open up the last chapter of the presentation which concerns truth because truth as a term 
and concept is evolving. One side of the story is that we have go we are going from broadcasted to network truth. Truth was something that was broadcasted to us from big institutions, big media outlets. And today we actually create our trust out in networks. Rand Corporation have tried to put some word on the, words on this and they actually, have actually dubbed it as truth is decaying. And that's increasingly because of a disagreement about facts and analytical interpretation of facts and data. There's a very much a blurring line uh, between what's opinion and what is facts. The increasing relative volume and resulting influence of opinion and personal experience over facts as well, with the whole underlying um, fundament of declining trust in formally respected sources of facts. Where does this take us, Casper? Well, one place it takes us is here, Flat Earth. How could it be that a Facebook group dedicated to uh, the idea that the Earth is flat has 55,000 members? Well, a group of scientists from the US went out with this question in mind to investigate. And they went to a flat Earth conference in the US and they just started asking people, how did you end up here? How did you decide to question the nature of the universe? And what they found was people don't just wake up one day and decide to question everything. No. They log on to YouTube. They maybe start by watching some Bigfoot videos, some videos about the 9-11 cover-up, some videos about whether or not NASA actually went to the moon. And slowly but surely, these networks, these algorithms lead them from relatively uh, harmless conspiracy theories into flat earth territory. A very ex extreme example of this uh, the rise of network truth is this, this guy, many of you might recognize him, Alex Jones from Infowars, the conspiracy fueled uh, news channel, which at its height of popularity had nearly 1.4 million visits each day. And much of this traffic was driven via social platforms such as YouTube and Facebook. Um, one interesting side note here is that Facebook actually decided to close Infowars page, Facebook page in 2018. Um, and this was sort of the, uh, the early stages maybe of Facebook moving from being purely a uh, platform to being a publisher with, with the, the, um, uh, the responsibilities that come with that new role. Another way of seeing this uh, rise of networked truth is that we as users have become source agnostic. It's not that we don't care about where our news and information come from. It's that it has become much more difficult for us to uh, recognize uh, whether or not something is fact or fiction, whether or not whether it is opinion or uh, journalistic content. Um, why is this? Well, because everything is presented to us in the same feed in the same hierarchy. So there's no distinction in your Facebook feed between an opinion piece, a piece of journalism, your best friend's uh, status post, and so on and so on. It's all blended together and it shares the same hierarchy in the social media feeds, which blinds the users to the different kinds of genres and types of media we consume. We also see a consequence of it in this attention hacking, uh, uh, which means that Small groups of users, small, sub, small subcultures of users can have an, an increasingly large effect on the public debate. A good example is from the US, the QAnon phenomena, where a small group of um, posters on an anonym, anonymous image board um, made it to appear like they were leaking cryptic uh, information from the White House about a Democratic Party conspiracy against Donald Trump. It started as very likely a joke on an online image board, but eventually ended up in uh, the news media, the mainstream news media, and eventually at Donald Trump rallies where people brought these uh, we are Q signs. Here in Denmark, we saw it recently, we have a parliamentary election coming up and one of the big newspapers uh, opinion poll was actually hacked uh, by uh, uh, users from an online image board. Here we can see the two of the smallest parties in Denmark gaining approximately 50% of the votes if we are to believe this poll and we are not of course because it, would, it was hacked by, um, by hackers. 
So we have all this misinformation, this uh, source agnosticism, this truth decay, this network truth. Where will it lead us? How will it look in 10 years? Well, Pew and Elon University did a survey of more than 1,000 media ex experts, and they asked them this question. Do you think that the media, the information environment will improve or will become worse in the next 10 years? They were divided straight down the middle, 50-50, between positive and negative outlooks. Uh, the positive ones believed, sure, we'll find solutions to our problems. Technology can help us. The negative ones believed that, well, sure, technology can help us somewhere along the way, but bad, bad actors, actors will continue to stifle our efforts. What they agreed about was that there are no technological quick fixes to the problem. So what kind of solutions are there to the problem? That's our question. And when we dig into it, we kind of saw a distinction between what we call reactive measures and proactive measures. And I will go through a couple of the reactive ones. Um, we see fact-checking. Fact-checking sites are um, bustling up all over Europe. We see it in <clears throat> Germany, in Denmark, and in Norway, for instance, where several of the European public service organizations are using some of their budget to fund these sites. And don't get me wrong, fact-checking sites are amazing, and we will probably need to use them a lot more in the future than we think by now, because it will help us as users to distinguish the truth from falsehood in the public debate. It will, however, um, still remain a reactive measure and not necessarily dealing with the root cause, as Casper will tell you about. We also have regulation as a reactive measure. Mm -hmm where the UK's Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sports suggests appointing an independent regulator to enforce rules and hold tech companies accountable for breaking them. That's one way of doing it. If we go a little east, um, we see in Singapore, they are a bit more radical to, uh, to come this problem to life. They're criminal criminalizing fake news to an extent where it's criminalized by spreading the falsehood, uh, falsehood information online. Offenders could face jail term for up to 10 years and fines for up to 735,000 US dollars. Um, this might be very effective, effective in terms of this stopping spreading of misinformation online. However, Singapore is also finding itself as 151st out of 80 countries below Russia and Myanmar in the World Press Freedom mm -hmm. Index of reporters. And what is also um, a point I, we want to add here is that the Singaporeans we have talked to here at SIFS in terms of this new law is uh, Singaporeans from the scientific environment. Um, and they're actually expressing a major concern because they're as, they as analysts and scientists will eventually publish analysis and um, reports on whatever they're studying. And these reports might not necessarily be the accurate truth, but an aspect of, of, a, greater, um, of a greater thing, which leaves them in a, in, a, in a gray zone as potential criminals, which is also why this, um, this law is not necessarily popular in our part of the world, because it's probably undermining what we call freedom of speech. Something has to be done because, because we can see that lies are spreading faster than the truth. An investigation by Science Magazine monitored over 100,000 rumors on Twitter for more than a decade and realized what is probably the obvious. However, here we have it black and white that False news cascades reach between 1,000 and 100,000 people, where the truth rarely reaches 1,000. So in a, in a hypothesis, where does this baby boomer navigate online? He's 60 years old. He's well-educated. He's new on Facebook. He's intrigued by active acts and memes and articles on 5G radiation. He follows Flat Earth Society and... Uh, it's doubtful whether he will check fact-checking sites. A new study from the New York University actually shows that baby boomers, like this guy we just portrayed, are sharing nearly seven times as many fake news articles on Facebook as adults under 30. What about the proactive measures, Casper? Well, 
Uh, as Nicholas said, fact checking is definitely important, and I think we will need much more of it in the future. But going beyond the purely reactive measures and engaging with the root cause of the problem, um, we will need to look at what kind of competencies we will need to foster in uh, citizens in the future to be able to better withstand this uh, misinformation environment. We asked uh, a, a panel of experts here at SIFS what they believe would be the most relevant skills in 2040. And the four highest on this list you can see on your screen are literacy, digital literacy, critical thinking, and ability to learn. Um, in a media context, this translates into media literacy. What is media literacy? Well, it's the ability to navigate, understand, and decode media, understanding how media is made, how it's funded, how news is selected, who is responsible for what in the news selection process. Um, it's important because there are indication studies being done that show that people who are more media literate tend to be less reliant on partisan sources, fake news, they are better at navigating social media and so on and so on. All these issues we have highlighted today um, could be remedied with a greater degree of media literacy. Everyone is a content creator today. Not everyone is a journalist. Not everyone knows the difference between opinion and fact, between falsehood and truth. This is very much a democratic uh, problem. We know that using and understanding, critically reflecting on media is a necessity to remain well-informed citizens in a democratic society. Um, here in Denmark, the Ministry of Culture um, has started paying attention to this uh, issue, issue of media literacy a little bit. They have allocated 2 million Danish uh, corner to strengthening media literacy. It is a start, but it is not a lot of money. And the question we want to raise here is, who plays a crucial role who is responsible for fostering media literacy in society? Is it the big tech companies? After all, they do facilitate an increasing share of our media consumption and production. Is it public service and commercial media? Is it politicians and governments? Is it ourselves as citizens or is it the education system? More than likely, the answer will lie somewhere in between across sectors and silos. We will probably need to think big if we want to engage this problem head on. On an end note, who plays a crucial role? This is a study that um, we want to take on. As an independent and not-for-profit institution, we often lean forward in the complex discussions and gather different stakeholders across the landscape here, in this sense, we wanted to study in a, a multi-stakeholder study in the fall of 19, how we can foster media literacy of the future. SIFS will look into the democratic responsibility of future media providers and how we can regain trust and provide content that sustains an informed public. And on that note, we want to say thank you for listening. The chat is open if you have any questions to the presentation or to Casper and I. Is there any questions? We will leave the chat open for five minutes or so and see if anyone uh, chips in.